the, welcome back to Microsoft Ignite Live here back at the stage. I'm Pumla Schmidt here with Sh Sinead O'Donovan. And we're going to be talking about building a, building a DMZ cloud. So that, to, to me, I, I'm traditionally, uh, I won't say an on-premises person, but my experience with the DMZ has always been from the on-premises environment. So this conversation is, is going to be very enlightening for me and, and I'm sure our audience as well. So let's just get started. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing at Microsoft first and then we'll dig right into this DMZ stuff. Sure, um, so my name is Sinead O'Donovan. It's not Sinead O'Connor, <laughs> but I'm grateful for her because it makes my name pronounceable. Um, and I run our network security engineering team at Microsoft and also our app delivery team. And I focus, network security is my, my uh, focus area. So when we talk about DMZ in the cloud, where do we even begin with that? Yeah, so I think, I think starting with your on-premise um, perspective is very good. Um, because I think for most customers today, they often only have three to 10 DMZs. Even if they're a large global company, um, they'll have one in North America, one in Europe, one in, a in APAC. And it really, that was okay when th their, all of their apps were in their own data centers, because the DMZ tended to be where their data center was. Yeah. But now as the customers are moving to using SaaS apps like Office 365, or they're embracing Azure as their cloud, they really, they need to look at their network security model differently. And they really need to look at more of a distributed connectivity model and running um, uh, their DMZ in the cloud itself um, and in order for them to get a really good experience for cloud applications. So you mentioned you know, multiple DMZs. Now, yep. I've had experience working with your smaller organizations where they have one. Yeah. In uh, some, I'm going to say, maybe not even really have a real DMZ. So how, you know, how do we help those, those types of organizations? I think the cloud is a, in a lot of ways for a small business, they, they, they were limited by their budget, they were limited by their IT capability. But now one of the nice things about security as a service is that they can take advantage of top class security at an affordable price. So once they go to sort of a SaaS uh, oriented security solution, they can have the same level of security that the, the big um, companies had, but they're paying for just what they need. And, and because when it's on a consumption billing, um, they really are, they can afford to get the best and only pay what their budget might allow. So it's actually democratizing security for the small business. How, how, do, how do they handle just management of that now? Is, is, that, is that turned over? to uh, operations or is there still a, a network security team that really manages that or is it just, you know, yeah. whomever? I, I see sort of customers moving in two different worlds. One world is um, user to application. We're seeing that become internet centric. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing, you know, like if you think about it, you're on your mobile phone, you're accessing your apps. You know, we know that you know, Windows devices, they'll have 5G built in and into them soon. So the, you, the users are using lots of apps to access their resources. And so you really have just have to assume that the internet is going to be your network of the future for user to app access. On the back end of, of, this, of the spectrum, the back end from the web app all the way back to the database, the processing, that'll be all in private connectivity. So if you look at sort of like a small business, they're not, they don't necessarily need a network engineer. They, what they need is just good internet connectivity in their office. And then what they need then is a, a security service that integrates in with their network uh, model. And in terms of managing it, one of the things we're doing in the cloud is really the SaaS, the security SaaS provider and the cloud providers are taking on that management okay. for the customer. So making it much more, they just couldn't worry about, well, what's the policies I want to create? What's the rules I want to enforce? But I, I'm taking them out of the infrastructure management piece. Because um. uh, I'm just thinking back in, in my time in a former life where I want a port open and I just call over the cubicle. Yeah. Be like, hey, can you open a port for me? And you know, he'd jump on the Cisco and he'd do his little thing. I guess that, that's kind of changed a little bit now. Yeah, I think what you've seen is in on-premise there was very separate roles. You had your networking team and they were very familiar with yeah. the Cisco products and they use the CLI and the open ports and, and stuff. But in the cloud, and then you had your devs building apps, and but in the cloud, it's actually all merged kind of together. And what organizations are wanting to do is they want to move faster and they want to embrace DevOps and they want to do infrastructure as code. And so as they embrace Buzzword. that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know, but, but it's true because what they want to do is they want to automate everything. They want to spin up the firewalls. They want to dynamically create the rules on yeah. the fly. And so as they do continuous integration, 
integration, they need the policies refreshed. So we're going to a much more agile world and security needs to modernize with it. And so it's less about trying to get an individual team to do something, but more how do you um, incorporate that into the life cycle of an application. Ah, like guardrails with governance. We just yeah. spoke on earlier. Because yeah. you know, that's really what you know, governance is, is, is guardrails. So you're pretty much doing a guardrail type. Yeah, well one of the things we just announced um, this Ignite was Firewall Manager. And with Firewall Manager, what you have is the concept of global policy and local policy. So the local policy will be done by the, by the DevOps engineers. They will do the specific security rooms that are specific to their app. But then the guardrails will be the global policy. What is it that I want all apps? What is the set of rules I want them all to govern? And because if the DevOps guy makes a mistake, I still want to make sure the company is protected. Okay, so we're, as, as we start talking buzzwords, yeah. let's talk more about zero trust. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Microsoft just recently published a really nice paper. I really encourage people to take a look about a month ago. And it just talks about Microsoft's approach to zero trust. And the first thing I would say with zero trust, no company is zero trust. Um, it's not possible for an organization to declare, I'm zero trust and I'm done. So I would just say it's a mindset, it's a framework, it's a model, it's an architectural blueprint. And so we just want customers to think that first. But it's a good reference model for whatever set of security practices you should follow across all the dimensions of your security landscape. And so at Microsoft, we kind of said there were seven key pillars and three core principles for the security model. And we give you a nice framework of how do you assess where you are, how do you evolve it, and what's the ideal state. Um, so to help organizations then move closer to a zero trust state. That was a lot to just absorb okay. in. <laughs> is, is zero, is zero trust is, is huge. I mean, just trying to understand the concept. Can we kind of repeat that a little bit? Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot to take in. Yes. I think one of the things, maybe you just start at these three foundation principles, okay. which is, you know, it's all about le you know, least privileged access. So really make sure that you're, you're not, and don't trust an open flat network. You really just don't assume any one signal is good enough. So you want, and you always want to give the least amount of access that is needed. And then we want you to continuously verify using lots of different signals. So it might be the user identity. Are they coming from a healthy machine? Are they, uh, is their behavior? behavior consistent. Right. So taking lots of signals into your access decision. And then the third core principle is all about assume that breach is possible. And so how do you detect that breach has happened? How do you prevent lateral movement? So the key thing there is on the back end, it's all about network segmentation. How do I really pre prevent, if a mistake happens, if something is intruded, how do I then detect it, fix it, and then make sure it doesn't spread to the other um, parts of the environment? Wow. Conditional access. Yeah. Let's, let's dig into that one. Yeah, so one of our core um, stories at Microsoft as part of our enterprise and mobility suite is all around conditional access. It's part of our identity and access management system, and it's the ability for you to set multiple policies around when user access should be granted. So you can take into account not just the user and the group, but the device they're coming from, the, the risk score of the device, you can trigger MFA. Um, so it's a whole really good model for how you can enforce zero trust access. Yeah, because when I think of conditional access, I'm just uh, reminded of uh, my, my mobile device, right? Because we have the, uh, if I'm using the right acronym, MAM, what it used to be. Yeah. It, it's, it's interesting how we've just taken this shift of, you know, Yes, you can access, no, you can't. And now it's like, well, let me think about all these different rules now. Yeah. So I, I, I really do like the way we were taking that approach. Um, so larger organizations, uh, like you mentioned, they're, they're forming these teams as DevOps. How does DevOps play into the whole you know, new DMZ firewall? Because everybody's doing things, not just in Azure, but they're on-premises, what about other clouds? How does this all play together? Yeah, um, we're, like in, in, in Microsoft, we're very much for the hybrid cloud and also understanding that you will be operating in multiple environments. So we give you really nice tools of how do, if you want to, as you want to use network security as one of your defense and depth mechanisms, we make it very easy for you to connect up all your environments. And so we also have this really new service, G8 last year called Virtual WAN, which makes it really easy for you, you to connect on-premise, 
place, whether you want to connect over express routes, say to your data center or headquarters, or you want to connect your branch offices with SD-WAN. So we've got this unified connectivity model, or if you even want to connect AWS or Google, you, we make it very easy for you to automate the connections into the DMZ. So that's the kind of the first um, sort of point. And then within the cloud environment, we've also made it very easy for you to construct hub and spoke models automatically in the cloud, all supporting DevOps principles. So how do you then, maybe what an organization might do is each DevOps team might have a spoke network that they work in, um, that they put on a set of rules, they are the local policies, and then we have an ability then for you, the IT group then to set global policy of maybe on your north, uh, your, uh, your traffic going to the internet, these are all the policies I must run in addition to the DevOps team's uh, rules as well. Okay, so when we talk about internet, we're, the biggest thing is speed, yeah. bandwidth. Yeah. You know, everyone's going to complain. This is the internet slow, the cloud is slow. Yeah. How, how does the DMZ factor into the speed of the access to your data? Yeah. So I think one thing that's very important, and this is where the strength of the Microsoft network comes in. We built our network, like, uh, you know, again, we're one of, the, some people say what, number one, number two, largest networks in the world. Um, so we're in 54 regions and then 160 edge sites. And so we've got this global, amazing global backbone that's completely software defined, where we're controlling jitter, latency, every hardware, we're, it's all, we're all in control of that. So the only thing that could, should be hurting a user's experience is distance. Unfortunately, we haven't fixed that problem. <laughs> But, uh, but, but as part of that, we think that as, as a customer, we want to make it very easy for them to use the power of the cloud to create DMZs in every region and ultimately to extend them to the network edges. And so we believe then that, that as we can work on latency and, and then we can do all the processing in the cloud, that we can really help have a good user experience for the cloud applications. Wow. That, that there's a lot to, to take in. Um, yeah, because I'm just thinking, oh, the riverbeds. I just remember dealing with riverbeds back yeah. before in a, in a previous life. Yeah. Um, any other key points you want to you know, bring out to our audience? Because I know it, it is a big deal when you are moving from on-premise to the cloud and it, it, yeah. there's just so much there. And where do yeah. you begin? Where do you start? And what if I'm halfway there and they need to make changes? Yeah. This is a lot. Yeah, I think what my kind of closing remarks would be, first of all, Take a look at your network traffic profile. Have you reached that tipping point where more than half your traffic is going to the cloud? If it has, you should modernize your network. You should definitely embrace a distributed connectivity model. And then you should also relook at use where you run your network security. And I would encourage people to try out Firewall Manager because not alone are we um, great, giving you an easy way to create a DMZ, but we've integrated with um, multiple network security providers um, so that you can construct that DMZ, not just with Microsoft tech, but also with third parties. And we really want to make it easy for customers to embrace this new model of connectivity and security. Ah, so we have about five minutes left. Um, again, what's the biggest key point? And are there other sessions that our attendees can, can watch uh, remotely or attend if they're here in Orlando that we can, you know, they can dig deeper into this? Yeah, so we had, um, I had a session yesterday and it was also called Building Your Cloud Perimeter. So I'd encourage yeah, you to yeah. watch that. Tell, tell, tell us more about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, that's where I went quite deep on network segmentation, and I also went uh, into the network, the firewall manager, and I went into what you can do about application protection too with web application firewall and DDoS protection. So I had a, a nice session. There was also a nice session on Azure Firewall itself. Um, Yusuf Khalidi, he did a really nice job on what's new in Azure networking. That was on Tuesday. Um, at, at, just after this session, there's a, a Daniel, uh, is doing a really nice story on how do you do application protection at the edge. Um, so that's just coming up. So that if people are free, I would encourage people to go to that. So there's a difference between protecting the application through application... Web application firewall. Okay, web application firewall. But yeah. then there's another component you're Called saying. Azure Firewall. So let me explain Yeah, because I'm like, wait a minute, wouldn't, wouldn't that be the same thing? You're well, you're giving me two devices now, or two virtual appliances. Well, first of all, they're not virtual appliances, they're services that uh, auto scale. Okay, okay. Stand they're corrected, yeah. yes. Um, but what's really important is Azure Firewall is all about traffic governance. Okay. So it's like, who's allowed to communicate with whom and under what conditions are the flows oh, allowed. Okay, okay. But when you look at something like a web app, 
you may be allowed to communicate, but maybe what if you've bad intent? What if you're trying to crack into the application? What are you trying to inject, uh, do SQL injection? Are you trying to intrude? Because a lot of web, a lot of apps are open to the internet. You know, it might be your shopping site, it mm. might be H&M.com, you're buying a new dress, and, and then you've got somebody coming in trying to hack in. So the web application firewall is all about protecting the web app, and it goes deeper into how I make sure the app itself is protected, and that the app is not um, okay. Each. Okay, because I, uh, you know, like most of us, we could have the two confused where, but, what if I just want to give access, RDP access to a particular server and environment? So the web application one probably isn't going to do. Uh, you know, yeah, so WAF, you would, you would typically put WAF under, um, in front of a web workload. But, okay. we d but bringing up remote access to your VM, we also have another new service, Azure Bastion, which will allow oh. you to remotely connect without giving a public IP to that VM. It gives you zero trust access, um, where you can use this Bastion service to reach that VM. And so we announced that at Ignite as well. And so from the Azure portal, very simple, click, connect, and you can remotely access RDP to Windows or SSH to Linux um, uh, without ever exposing that VM to the internet. Wow, so as long as uh, the user or the admin has access to that VM, they can jump as long right as they have the credentials, if they have, As long as they have credentials to the VM, and, then, um, and they can just use the Azure portal, and so as long as they have internet access and they can reach Azure portal, then they can reach that VM. How does that work with multi-factor? What if they have multi-factor enabled? Is, yeah, it is. That is pretty seamless? It, that, that's pretty seamless as well. So you can enable for Bastion, you can turn on MFA, so as part of accessing your, your Bastion service, you can also um, uh, leverage MFA um, uh, in order to use the Bastion service to connect to the VM. Wow, because I mean, it, I'm just thinking here, well, you know, from a managing a server perspective, that pretty much means you can do that anywhere, even on the beach. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so it's a really nice service because what pe customers had to do before is they had to create a jump box. Yeah, I, rem I remember being on the jump boxes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So this is really nice to get rid of the jump box. And just, again, this is all part of the dev agility. We're trying to make it easy in the cloud for you to build and secure apps and just go fast and still be, be protected. Wow. Well, we're just about running out of time, so I want to thank you again, Sinead O'Donovan. Yes. <laughs> Not O'Connor. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> but th thank you again for speaking all about the good stuff about having a DMZ in the cloud. And stay tuned for David Lee's breakout session that we'll be covering what's new and what's next for the Windows Admin Center. Ooh, I like that one. Which starts shortly here at 11.45. And we'll be back here live immediately following the conclusion of the session. See you soon, and stay warm. Ha, ha, ha.